So today's workshop is on feminism versus culture. We are at a historical crossroads around the world where we are watching leadership fail us and the paucity of our state systems and resources has become painfully visible. Alongside battling a global health pandemic, there are revolutionary movements taking place across the world. People are demanding change from Black Lives Matter in North America to student protests in Balochistan to Dalit activism in India. People are risking their lives and health safety to make the world a more equitable place for everyone so that funds go to the right areas of resource building, such as housing, health care, education, food security, and social programming, not war and not policing. Many of us have lost loved ones, jobs, and school semesters over the past several months. For us to come together in this period of grief, in this virtual space, to open our minds to new learning and to new thinking is a personal political act. It's the first and repeated step that we can take to take action to build a more just world. Welcome to my PACE workshop on feminism versus culture. Thank you all for being here and thank you to the workshop organizers for putting together this series of events. So before we get into the topic of our workshop, I want to tell you a little bit more about my work. Um, as Farhana has just commented, uh, sent an introduction through the comments, um, I'm a researcher um, and I work in a variety of areas of uh, social impact awareness and, and social justice. Um, and I've done this work in multiple places. I'm from Canada. Um, so I've done this work in Canada. I've done this work in India uh, and Pakistan and, and the UAE. Now, in all of these places, I have had wonderful and fruitful experiences. But I have also, in all of these places, experienced gender discrimination and racial discrimination, um, both of those at the same time. I've also witnessed this happen to other people. So in order to understand some of these experiences and to think through them, um, feminist thought has become a big part of my approach to understanding my lived experience and my professional experience and trying to improve these, not only, not only for myself, but also for others. Feminism and culture. These words represent two ideas that are seen by many to be an irreconcilable competition, forever clashing, neither one willing to concede the way two like poles of a magnet repel one another. Across India and Pakistan, feminism is seen as a Western invention, and the women who identify as feminists viewed as ready to abandon their national culture. Their understanding of women's identities and roles in the world is seen as having been corrupted by Western thought. In Islamabad, sometimes when people hear me talk about my feminist ideas, they tell me, but you can't do that here. Or if I express outrage at discriminatory incidents, they remind me that this is just what society is like here. And that it is because I am an outsider that I make the mistake of expecting more. People sometimes think that because I have grown up in Canada, the West, 
I must have grown up without the pressures of culture. They even feel a little bit sorry for me because, according to them, growing up in the West must mean I was raised like a white person. Someone, in their understanding, who lives and goes about their day-to-day -day without a tr traditional value system to tie them to community and to the past. And so, without a cultural environment to ground my so-called authentic identity, no wonder I turn to wayward ideas such as Western feminism. But, as anyone who has grown up as the child of immigrants can tell you, the pressures to maintain culture are comparable and sometimes they are even tougher because the threat of the West for our parents is not 10,000 kilometers away. It is right outside your door in the myriad people, ideas, food, music, and entertainment that threaten the sanctity of Indianness and Muslimness. The trade our parents made was this. For a better economic future and educational opportunities, their children would bear the responsibilities of maintaining traditional cultural values reap the benefits of the developed West, but remain true to who you are. So in this talk, I'm going to tell some stories from my own life experiences learning about femininity and masculinity. And while I do so, I hope that these spark memories of your own stories so that we can discuss these during the question period, during the discussion period, rather. To say that I grew up in a strict household where I was expected to study hard and achieve good grades, the typical story of many kids of immigrant families would be incorrect. The truth is, as an only child, I grew up having to figure out much about life on my own. My mother was busy with daily household chores, and my father, an accountant, worked two full-time, two jobs, one full-time throughout the day, and then an evening, an additional evening shift. Sometimes, I think my parents were just trying to make sense of the life they had embarked upon for financial gains that separated them from everything they loved, their families, their home, India. Everything that gave them culture, identity, and belonging. Enrolled in an engineering program in the US in the 1960s, my father missed Bombay so much, he returned home without completing his degree. Several years later, he attempted a second move abroad, this time to Toronto where among several odd jobs, he lifted boxes at a packaging plant during the day and earned an accounting certificate by night. My mother taught herself how to type and shorthand and got herself a job as a secretary at a small office. Together, the two of them put my father through college, paid the rent, brought me into the world, and eventually bought a house. They had achieved the Canadian version of the American dream. Not a lot was wished or dreamed for me, however, and I don't know today if this is because I was a girl, as I grew up without brothers and don't have a comparison point, but I suspect it was. When I am less angry about the neglect I experienced, I remember that my parents shared the best of themselves with me. It was my mother who taught me arithmetic and the joy of reading. I learned algebraic calculations from my father and for the first time about Marx and communism and his distaste for these, a view that I don't share. When I am more angry, I remember 
that it did not matter how much I achieved in school. When I excitedly brought home excellent test scores, I was told to remember not to be proud, that pride only fed the ego. I was not the child of parents who asked why my grade was a 95% and not a 99%. No one read the history essays that I had taken days to write. We did not talk about what I would be when I grew up. As a child, I was often admonished for being awkward, an awkward chatterbox, and saying disrespectful things in the company of my parents' friends. I tried being quieter, but was reprimanded then for being too shy. My friend's parents complained to my parents that I was too bossy when playing with their children. I wanted to meet my parents' expectations, but I also wanted to be myself and for them to like me. But I found it impossible to please them and trying to do so confusing. I was somehow unable to master the skill of pretense that's expected to come naturally to young South Asian women. That delicate art of being seen and not heard. Exasperatedly, in Gujarati, they used to ask me, Tu kya re dai banish? Roughly translated, it means, Tum kab achi beti banogi? When will you become a well-behaved good girl? I once cheekily answered, never. At the age of 11, my best friend told me it looked like my two eyebrows were going to turn into one eyebrow and that if I were particularly unlucky, the hair would continue to grow down the bridge of my nose. Until this day, I had gone about my life without a care about my body, without any feelings of shame. I wore frocks to school, which my mother had stitched, because she believed that school-going girls wore dresses and their hair in two plates with red ribbons. This, however, didn't stop me from using the jungle gym in the schoolyard. One day, a boy pointed out that my underwear showed every time I did a flip on the bar. And I told him with great confidence that this did not matter. Everyone wears underwear. And then I did even more flips on the bar in order to prove that I didn't care. That evening, I went home determined, but unsure how, to get ahead of the problem of my unruly eyebrows. I didn't know as yet about the Hindi movie actress Gajol and how she had refused to pluck her unibrow, believing it to be a sign of her unique beauty. I knew instinctively not to ask for my mother's help with this dilemma. There would be no sympathy from her. The thought of asking my father didn't even cross my mind. First, I tried tweezing but couldn't stand the pain. Eyes stinging, nose streaming, I winced with every pluck. And there was my father's disposable Gillette razor, primary blue, lying on the counter, plying me with a solution. Within seconds, I had shaved a neat little runway down the center of my brow. Problem solved, mission accomplished. That day, after dinner, on his way out for his evening shift, my father looked at me in disgust, his face contorting in rage. You did this because of boys, he yelled, the scorn dripping from his voice. Flash forward, some 25 years later, 
I'm working as a researcher for a development organization in Islamabad, which is running a vocational training program for young women from rural and urban poor backgrounds. In addition to receiving training in trades, such as teaching, fishing, photography, and social work, participants are also required to complete what are known as life skills courses. The teaching material comprises valuable information on topics such as job searching, resume writing, interview giving, developing leadership characteristics, exploring one's creativity, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, general and reproductive health and nutrition, budgeting and financial planning. Everything you need to know to become a mentally and physically healthy, emotionally intelligent person with professional prospects. The teaching material caught my attention for other reasons, however. One, a considerable portion was spent on warning of the dangers of sexual harassment, how to recognize it, how to protect against it, and how to launch complaints. The young women in the vocational training program were also told to follow a list of rules when interviewing or at work. These were, do not wear bold prints, bright makeup, heavy jewelry, or high heels. Do not bore your superiors with long answers. Do not be led by your emotions. Help without expecting anything in return. Smile. Don't fidget and don't look here and there. Don't talk too much or too fast and don't disagree. The messaging? Don't be feminine. Don't behave like a man. Don't be noticed at all. What kind of a world have we built if the strongest message we are delivering to women is this? If you want paid labor, if you want financial security, if you want to be a person in the world who contributes unique skills, expertise, and talent, you must risk sexual violence. On top of this, we also tell women, you must also risk your organization, your family, and your community believing you are at fault if you are sexually harassed or assaulted. Therefore, it is your job, in addition to your paid job, to maintain your respectability, your izzat, at all times. We teach women a number of contradictory things in order to teach them that a woman's worth lies not in her intelligence or her productivity, but in her cultural modesty. Women must be beautiful, slender, and fair in order to attract marriage suitors, but not for themselves and certainly not at work. If they pay attention to their appearance for their own sense of self, that means they might distract themselves from their ability to do their jobs and others. If women break these rules, they'll attract the wrong kind of attention and possibly become victims of sexual harassment. On top of all of this, we tell women that they must not speak up or disagree. Such a patriarchal structure of disempowerment also does a major disservice to men. It teaches them 
not to value women as professional equals, but as objects of desire. It teaches men how to be sexual harassers and predators in professional spaces and how to get away with it. Instead, how do we create professional spaces for women so they don't have to be distracted by the fear of sexual violence and can instead fully focus on their creativity and their critical thinking? Flashback 15 years prior. Toward the end of my undergraduate studies, my father was terminated from his job. The company was expanding and modernizing, and at 60, just a few years away from retirement, in their eyes, he had become redundant. He did not say it, but my father was shattered, fearful and helpless against the injustice of his disposability. My father's purpose in the world, as a man, to earn money to support his family, the reason he left his home and family behind had ended in a perfunctory thank you note after 20 years of loyalty. A few years earlier, my mother had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease a neurological condition that steadily and determinedly destroys one's cognitive abilities, including the independent capacity to work and perform tasks, maintain bodily hygiene, read and converse. Just as my father lost his job, my mother became increasingly dependent on us for her daily care. My father had no one to turn to but me, and suffice it to say, the eyebrow incident was but the start of many disagreements over my body, my behavior, and what I believed in. Our relationship was also in shambles, and as I failed to become a good Indian woman, our relationship became irreparable, and I had to look, and I looked to feminism to make my way my own way in the world. Where my father was broken, I was outraged. I made him return to work and serve out his notice period while I found him a lawyer. One was so expensive and his exploitative sale tactics so brazen, I yelled at him and told him I wouldn't let my father fall prey to the predatory nature of his charlatan business. I stormed out of his office. My father meekly apologized for my behavior and thanked the lawyer for his time. Eventually, we found one who was slightly more empathetic and negotiated a severance package that would cover my mother's medicines. My father accepted early retirement with a grace I didn't know that he was capable of. He took over the cooking and the cleaning, created a routine to spend time with my mother, take her to visit her friends, take her to the mandir, bathe, and clean her. When it came to my mother's institutional health care, however, he was stubbornly resistant. I suppose the doctors, hospitals, and the drugs only solidified changes he did not want to face and the eventuality they could not prevent. Against his wishes, I sent my mother to an adult daycare facility a few days of the week. Against his wishes, I hired a nurse to help out with her care and provide him with some respite. One day, I discovered the doctors had stopped my mother's treatment without informing me to see what would happen. In some twisted experiment that followed my father asking why Alzheimer's medicine couldn't cure her disease. 
It was me who held the head of the neurology division accountable and made sure no other interruptions took place in her care. I never learned to behave. And I am quite sure that some will say, you can't do this workshop in Pakistan. So why is my story important? It is important because it is ordinary, because it is one of many like it, about culture, immigration, loss, and the pain of making one's own way. In the same way, all of you who are participating in this workshop will have stories about gender and various other intersecting identities that have all shaped your lived experience, from class, to race, to ethnicity, to religion, to sexuality. One of the ways I have learned how to live a feminist life and strategies for coping with different kinds of discrimination is hearing other people's stories, particularly women's stories, and sharing mine with them. These experiences grounded me and gave me belonging in kinship long before I saw my experiences as products of patriarchy. Sharing these stories has become a form of refuge, the ability to parse them out, to analyze them, and bring them back together, while empathizing with other women's pain, at times victimization, and celebrating and learning from their victories. I draw my inspiration from a variety of feminists, but in particular, black public intellectuals and writers such as Roxane Gay and Chimamanda Adichie, both talented storytellers who know how to find the political and the personal. In her TED talk, We Should All Be Feminists, Adichie says, if the full humanity of women is not our culture, then we must make it our culture. Roxane Gay, in a recent workshop, explained that public intellectuals need to create the space for others to speak. Sharing and storytelling allow one to look back on life and understand some of the things that happened to oneself, why, and the larger systems and processes they are part of that may have been out of our control at the time. Sharing and storytelling can free you. And they provide the space for others to know they are not alone in their experiences. So what I'm trying to encourage here, particularly to undergraduate students, is how to use these few years you have for learning, for learning outside the classroom, through building social connection and shared introspection. So let's try and do that now by discussing your questions and comments. Okay, so um, I know people have been commenting uh, from the beginning of the talk, so uh, I'm just gonna s uh, try and scroll to the top of the questions and, um, and deal with them one by one. So just give me a moment here. Okay, so uh, this first question is from um, Kalsum Razak, and the question is, do you think gender discrimination is only done to females, or are males also discriminated in society? 
Um, so I try to deal with this question um, in the story that I told. Because the story that I told is actually a story about my father. Um, I think that while men do not experience direct discrimination from based on their gender, they do they do experience the problem of masculinity. Um, masculinity is the idea that in order to participate in the world, whether that's with your family or at work uh, or in in society amongst your friends, the idea is that you have to be a real man. And a real man, the way we conventionally and problematically define this, is someone who is never weak, um, who's always strong, uh, who, who looks a particular way. Um, the idea of muscles being connected to masculinity. These, these kinds of pressures that society puts on men um, make it very difficult for them to be in touch with their emotions. And because to be a man and to be in touch with your emotions and to express your emotions, um, particularly negative emotions, is seen as a kind of weakness. So for example, in the story about my father, I talk about how him feeling like a man was connected to him feeling like a provider, someone who earns money for the family, um, someone who takes care of his family. When all of these things were taken away from him, things that he had worked on for decades, emotionally he was broken. And he didn't, he didn't really know, he didn't really have the capacity to look after himself. So inst instead, if we can teach all people and men that there is strength in the ability to be vulnerable, the ability to be emotional, then that way we can, we can build a society that has far more equal participation in it. Okay, so I hope I uh, answered that question. Um, please ask further questions um, as we go and then I, I can try and come back to this topic. Um, now I'll try and go to the next question. So the next question is, what is the role of culture in promoting feminism? I mean, to answer this question, I guess I'd want to take off from the quote that I selected from Adichie and the idea that if we can change culture, then we can promote feminism. Uh, like I was trying to explain, we look at these ideas as polar opposites. Um, we see feminism as against culture. We need to, I think, have 
a broader understanding of what culture is. I think we often think about culture, I think we think about culture in two ways. There's big C culture and little C culture. And big C culture is stuff like food and traditional clothing and dance. But little C culture is the culture that we live every day. It's our everyday life. Um, it's the things that we believe in but don't necessarily vocalize all the time um, that guide our social relationships. And when those cultures are oppressive and they get challenged, we, we react. So one of the things that feminism tries to do is introduce a new kind of culture, a culture of equality, a culture of diversity. If we can rebuild culture taking from feminism, then the two can support each other. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Okay, so this is an interesting question. How do we define feminism in a word? I think feminism means many different things to many different people depending on what systems of oppression they are trying to, to push back against. Um, I think it's important for all of us to have our own definition of feminism that is tied in our experiences. So, you know, if someone were to ask me um, on a very fundamental level, I would say that it is a movement for gender equality. Um, I would also stress that our feminism needs to be intersectional, meaning it has to account for the ways in which all of us are at some points disempowered, but at other points also privileged. And so that means we need to think about whether our political thoughts and actions also emancipate other people who have uh, reduced or different forms of access to power. I'm going to come back to that question um, as I look at the other questions, and, and I think uh, I think this might become more clear. Okay, so we have another question here which says society demands that women must be beautiful fair and attractive and if she if a woman doesn't fulfill this demand then she would not be considered a successful woman yeah absolutely um and the example that i used um I was trying to talk about how the idea of a woman being interested in her own appearance or her beauty, um, there isn't room for that in professional spaces. Uh, but on the other hand, you're right. Um, there is also an expectation that, uh, that women should um, be conventionally attractive, look a particular way in order, in order to circulate in, in the public world. I think that this is one of the, the difficult things um, to navigate when it comes to, to patriarchy uh, because 
patriarchy makes the rules about what is feminine in what space and what is not feminine in another space. And so the rules can change at any time. Um, so that's why... Um, I'm just thinking of a scenario here. If you have, uh, you know, if you have a woman um, who, let's say, in an office space, chooses not to uh, not to not to follow conventional beauty standards around, um, you know, let's say, wearing makeup or straightening her hair. Um, she might get, get made fun of for um, not caring about these things, um, being too much like a man, um, which is a particularly phobic thing to say. Um, so what's happening is standards are being set by society, um, structures and capitalism that are that are not really achievable um, and the idea is that you just have to try and keep on meeting those standards um, and this is a really problematic idea because it takes away from space in the world for people's individual identity. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, okay, so we have um, in Pakistan, feminism is thought to be an idea built on the narrative of hating men. Um, is feminism all about hating men? Feminism is not about hating men. Feminism is about wanting to bring down and dismantle structures of patriarchy um, and misogyny these also victimize men. I think one of the reasons that people think that feminism is about hating men um, is because one of the difficult realities is as much as masculinity and patriarchy internally impoverish men, um, leaving in them in a place where they cannot adequately connect with their emotions, they still have power in society, in public space, in families. Feminism is about undoing these structures and building a new structure so that everyone can participate equally. And it's really, really important to understand that. I think another reason that um, people worry that feminism is about hating men is because a lot of feminist activism is focused on the freedom of women's bodies. And one of the things that um, gets misunderstood is that the freedom to wear what you want, for example, is the freedom to use public space in the way that you want. And this is a pressure that men don't face. And so one of the things that happens is men end up becoming the example of what feminism is against. They end up becoming the representatives. And in many ways, they are the agents of sexism and patriarchy and misogyny in society. 
um, it's easy for us to understand that when we uh, when we think about um, what we think of as an evil person, such as a sexual harasser or a rapist, but it's harder for us to understand that when we are thinking about men who we associate with on a day-to-day basis, from our friends to our brothers to our fathers. But as I tried to show in my story, the pressure to be a man also tugs away at a man's humanity. And one of the reasons that we can understand this has to do with feminist writing and feminist activism. This kind of writing and activism not only wants to bring about freedom for women, but it also wants to bring about freedom for men. Okay. Um, Okay, so we have a couple questions here about um, why is feminism taken as a negative term in Pakistan um, and what role is feminism playing in Pakistan? So, I mean, I think I've answered the first question throughout my talk. The reason that it is seen as negative is because it is against South Asian culture. And South Asian culture, um, whether it's Indian or Pakistani, um, is seen that is is seen as something that is historic. Um, and and it's connected up to how we um, identify as Indian or Pakistani here or in the diaspora. Um, and feminism is seen as a movement that, uh, that could disrupt that. And for that reason, it is um, negatively and incorrectly understood as Western. Because um, we also understand Westernness as being against South Asian culture. We understand these two things as polar opposites. Um, but the reality is that um, there, are, there are indigenous forms of feminism that come out of South Asia. They have historically come out of South Asia. They are deeply critical of uh, Western feminism or white feminism. Um, and if we, if we look at how the history of feminism, say, in Pakistan is grounded in the history of wanting to make this country a more equitable place, then we can, then we can move toward a far more positive understanding of its role. So, so to connect it then to the next question about what role is feminism playing in Pakistan? Um, it's playing lots of roles. Um, uh, this is where we need to we need to look at our history and um, what I would. So, uh, I came to understand. Uh, feminism in Pakistan when I um, looked a little bit at the history of activism under uh, Zia ul uh, in the 80s. Um, that's when the Women's Action Forum was uh, formed. The, sorry, the Women's Action Forum was formed. Um, and these were challenging um, the the, some of the laws put into place that um, would make women, women's lives very difficult um, with respect to to rape charges. Um, so, 
at a time where the country was seeing um, increased right-wing thought, women were protesting in the streets not only for their own freedoms, but for everybody's freedoms. So that's one of the starts. Um, that's a starting point for understanding what role feminism plays in Pakistan. Um, if you want to look at current, um, the current role, a really good place to start is the activist group Girls at Dhabas. Um, they do some, they put out some really interesting writing and they're involved in some really great um, um, ways of taking up public space um, in order to put the message out that um, everyone and women should have equal access to public space. Um, we are seeing um, other examples of feminism, uh, for example, coming out of the protests in uh, the student protests in Balochistan right now, where um, students don't have access to proper internet connectivity, so they can't um, attend online classes. Um, women are a strong part of of those protests. They are they are risking their lives um, in order to make sure that um, everybody uh, in at their university has equal access to education. Um, when you, this is what intersectional feminism is about. I think it is often, feminism is often understood as some kind of, you know, women's only movement for increased representation. Um, and that's one understanding. Um, but, uh, the understanding of feminism needs to be far more intersectional and far more diverse. Um, and there are there are feminists in Pakistan who are who are practicing that um, in the information that they put out in their writing and in and in their public activism. Um, how do you see the future of feminism in Pakistan? Is the next question. Um, So, I think it's going to be interesting to see um, how this future plays out. The, the Audit March um, this year and last year is wonderfully insistent um, on putting out messages about equality, particularly particularly related to women's bodies, um, and there's a lot of backlash. But the things that are being said in the slogans are, they are so on point. Um, and the way that they're on point shows how we live in a culture, not just here and around the world that is invested in a particular kind of silencing of, of women's thought Um, but even as that attempt to silence women grows, the people who want to see gender equality aren't backing down. And there is, there are more and more access, there's more and more access to resources so that, um, People can learn more and more about feminist activism. Um,
And there's more and more, it's also because, it's really interesting and I learn a lot from it as well to see how um, the more critical feminisms are also becoming very intersectional. So they're taking, they are also taking into account uh, class and ethnicity um, and we are seeing this in the in the movements here um, and and across the world. So I think I think the future of feminism here is bright. Okay, um, just going to see how we're doing for time. All right. Okay, so I'm going to just take a look at the questions in groups and then uh, decide how to, how to address them. Okay. All right, so it's just a few more questions. Um, let me take a look here. So there's a question here which says, um, how can we play an effective role in being a feminist. Um, I think there's all kinds of ways. Uh, for me, for example, um, it was, as I explained in the talk, um, thinking through some of my own life stories and analyzing them um, from a feminist perspective that I have now that I didn't necessarily have when I was younger. Um, so I would say that a big part of it um, is internal uh, and, and personal. Um, and it's about how you think through uh, some of your life experiences and, then, um, and how you understand those and then the decisions that you might take going forward. Um, and that could be things like um, who do you choose to mentor uh, when, when you're in a position of power in a workplace? Um, I think that activism and um, which in the form of the Aarhus March, for example, is an effective way of being a feminist because um, it is extremely symbolic to take up public space like that, to be heard, to get your message across, um, especially in societies around the world where um, women and other kinds of disenfranchised people um, are being told to be quiet and to behave and to accept the positions that they have where they do not have access to resources. Um, I think that feminism, to, to, be, to, to, to be a feminist um, for me as well is to, to learn as much as I can. Um, so there are lots of good feminists to, to read to read. Um, there are lots of online resources um, through which you can, you can get informed and develop how you think. A, a conscious effort um, to learn about feminist histories and 
and and feminist activism, a conscious effort to make that a part of your, your life and make that a part of your learning, to make that a part of your approach. I think that's that's a big piece of what being a feminist is about. Another question here, which is, um, what is the difference between the concept of feminism in Pakistan and other countries? Um... I guess the way I would want to answer this question is to say that anywhere in the world it's important for feminism to be intersectional. Um, I would say different places in the world have um, different levels of development and with different levels of development, um, you're going to see not just women disenfranchised, but other uh, forms of minority communities also disenfranchised. So whether that's according to uh, race or ethnicity um, or caste. And so the important thing to do is to think about how how does how does my feminism intersect with other forms of disenfranchisement and does my feminism help uplift those forms of disenfranchisement as well so that i think is what we need to see happening around the world for um for for feminism to achieve its emancipatory potential Another question here, which is, why are women always considered weak in our society? I think that women are considered weak, the weaker sex, if you will, around the world. That's not something that is unique to Pakistan. Um, I think the idea of femininity has a lot to do with this. Um, the the messaging that we get with respect to beauty standards and um, and fashion um, for the majority of the time conventionally speaking there is there is this equation taking place between um, prettiness and frailty um, if you look at analyses of um, advertising, for example. Uh, these analyses will talk about how um, when women pose, they are leaning against something or they are, uh, they are bending their knee or crossing their legs. Um, these are these symbols of, of femininity, these symbols of um, beauty are also uh, symbols of weakness and, and dependence. Um, and I think that if this is the kind of messaging that um, everyone is subjected to, then, and this is just one example of one of the ways in which women are portrayed as weak, which is connected to beauty, and um, beauty is a prize characteristic uh, for women um, in this wider discourse. Uh, if this is the messaging that we receive all the time, um, then that's one of the reasons that uh, we that we perceive women in this way. Um, one of the other reasons that we perceive women this way is because we have these we have ideas about biology, about men being stronger and women being weaker, and then we attach um, a whole set of social ideas to that. Um, so. The idea is that if um, a, w a man is physically stronger than a woman, if he is bigger than a woman, um, then that, in the way that we have conventionally understood gender categories, the idea that's related to that then is that women are dependent on men because they are weaker. 
both the biological ideas about gender differences and the social ideas about gender difference uh, uh, gender differences are ideas that we have historically invented and and normalized and the more and more um, that we go along with these conventional ideas the more and more we think of women as weak and incapable of doing uh the, doing things that everybody can do okay so the next question we have is Uh, okay, so I'm just going to read this aloud here so I have it um, clear. My question is, why do radical feminists focus on women and why are they keen to overthrow the existing system of patriarchy? patriarchy? Why don't they become liberal feminists and focus on both men and women equally as they would to reform the existing system. Okay, so uh, I, um, I think I'll come to this, I think someone asked this question later about the difference between radical feminism and liberal feminism. So I don't, in this, I understand the question, but I don't think that the definitions have been understood properly. Um, so, okay, radical feminism is intersectional feminism. Um, the kind that I have been trying to describe for you uh, throughout this talk, where it is conscious of other existing systems of disenfranchisement and attempts to liaise with those in order to uh, bring about equality in a in a in a variety of areas for all disenfranchised people. Okay, that's what radical feminism is about. Radical feminism is intersectional feminism. I think we have a stereotype in mind when we think about radical feminism that comes from images from the West of um, of things like bra burning. Um, this is also one of the ways in which I think we also invalidate the work of current South Asian feminists. We quickly associate them with um, our uh, a view of what we think is is Western in order to um, invalidate the real claims that are coming out of uh, radical, transnational, intersectionalist feminism out of South Asia, okay? So the idea that um, a liberal feminist is focused on both um, men and women, again, so what I want to state here, so as you saw um, or as you heard in my story, my story was about my father and how he was compromised by masculinity in a number of ways, okay? An intersectionalist, an intersectional feminist approach um, allows for an understanding of how masculinity impoverishes men. And as I said before, despite this internal form of impoverishment, the reality is because we have a patriarchal structure, men tend to be able to take far greater advantage of that than women are able to. And so the focus from feminism is about making access to resources available to everyone on a level playing field. 
So that's why the focus is on the women, because the men already have a great chunk of the power and a great chunk of the access to the resources. Okay, so I think I've sort of cleared up the question about radical feminism and liberal feminism. Okay, okay so um, that seems to be the last of the questions. Um, so I will close here, I will end the session. Um, Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you for listening to my story. And thank you to PACE again for organizing this series of events and inviting me to talk. Um, it was a great experience for me, and I do thank you for it.